This is a little bit different because uh, on this particular Sunday, which is actually tomorrow, I'm reporting this on Saturday, um, we are short on technical staff. So I'm recording this message ahead of time, hoping to post it as a premiere on YouTube, and if you're watching it, then it was successful. Um, so the Lord be with you today. Unfortunately, we can't stream the service, but I wanted you to have at least the sermon. But just a few words about the sermon before I begin. This is a message that is very, has been weighing heavily on my heart for several months. Uh, and it is a message probably a little longer than what I usually deliver and uh, perhaps a little heavier because I want us to see, the Lord has prompted me to share this message with you because I think it's important that we understand the reality in which we live and the days are difficult. And uh, so I want to share that with you, but obviously the gospel is always full of hope. So I will be sharing that word with you as well. But I just want to give you that idea. The Lord be with you if you can't be with us this, mor this, this morning. Uh, may God be with you and open your heart and your mind as you hear this word that I believe the Lord has laid on my heart. On April 11th, 1970, the crew of Apollo 13 lifted off from Cape Kennedy, the Kennedy Space Center, 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 I should almost start over again, the Kennedy Space Center on the Florida coast. That was their third effort to land men on the moon. But three days into the mission and nearly a quarter of a million miles away from Earth, there was an explosion in one of the oxygen tanks and the crew's message back to Earth has been immortalized in the words, Houston, we've had a problem. The mission, which had been focused on exploration and discovery, was radically changed in just a moment. All of the efforts of the crew now and their support team on Earth were now focused on the men's survival and return home. They abandoned their plan to land the, on the moon and instead they circled around it in order to use its gravitational pull to slingshot the craft back to Earth. The whole saga of improvisation and survival was effectively, effectively dramatized on film in 1995. In a sense, I believe that we in American culture may be having our Apollo 13 moment. Perhaps unlike the astronauts, we haven't heard an explosion. But the cultural currents coming out of the COVID pandemic are enough to alert us that America is in a dangerous place. It's true that our economy is problematic with inflation certainly looming on the horizon. But the issues which concern us are much deeper and more dangerous than the faltering economy. Like the damaged ventilation system in Apollo 13, the deterioration of our national soul is the very cultural air that we breathe. For nearly five years, I have made it my practice to read one chapter in Proverbs every morning. It's very simple. Proverbs has 31 chapters, uh, and each month has at least 31 days, and so it's easy to wait, make your way through uh, and read a chapter a day. It's a good discipline. It may not be the very best way of reading Scripture. There are many ways to read Scripture. Uh, this way of reading Scripture doesn't allow itself towards uh, deep meditation on a, say, a proverb. But one of the things that it does is that week in, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, and year after year, the message, the themes of Proverbs begin to become coalesced and crystallized in your mind. It begins to impact the way that you think. And one of the themes that, it, that pervades Proverbs is that of wisdom contrasted with foolishness. The wisdom is not reserved for some culturally elite people class of people. Wisdom has opened her arms to everyone who will simply listen to her and embrace her. But sadly, too many people have rejected wisdom's call. The fear of the Lord, the scripture says, is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And as I have pondered these truths from Proverbs, I have often thought of the trajectory of our American culture. We're not only ignoring wisdom's call to embrace her, it seems that we are actively drowning her out with our own siren calls of foolishness. Our text this morning then is from the first chapter of Proverbs, beginning in verse 20. 
Wisdom shouts in the streets. She cries out in the public square. She calls to the crowds along the main street and to those gathered in front of the city gate. How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? How long, you mockers, will you relish your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and make you wise. I called you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice and rejected the correction that I offered, so I will laugh when you are in trouble. I will mock you when disaster overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster engulfs you like a cyclone, and anguish and distress overwhelm you. When they cry for help, I will not answer. Though they anxiously search for me, they will not find me. But they hated knowledge and chose not to fear the Lord. They rejected my advice, and they paid no attention when I corrected them. Therefore, they must eat the bitter fruit of living their own way, choking on their own schemes. For simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency, but all who listen to me will live in peace, untroubled by fear of harm. Let's pray. Father, we are gathered together as your people, a people who seek and are committed to hearing your word. And this word this morning is difficult. Lord, give us the humility to embrace and accept and hear your word to us and the courage to follow you. Help me to present and as I share the burden you have laid on me. May we as a people be open to what the Spirit has to say to the church this morning. We pray this all for your kingdom's sake in Jesus' name. Amen. We are truly a blessed nation. We just sang the words to Catherine Bates' immortal patriotic hymn, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Indeed, he had. From our humble beginnings with the Pilgrim Fathers, we had acknowledged our dependence upon God. Even the radical deist Thomas Jefferson, whom I would never claim was a Christian, wrote into the Declaration of Independence that our freedoms were given to us by our Creator God. And throughout our history and the struggle to remain a unified nation, it seems that God has intervened at the most critical points. For example, in the early months of the War for Independence, the Continental Army under General George Washington had suffered a severe defeat in the Battle of Long Island. They were trapped and surrounded by, with the British General Howe just waiting for daylight to finish mopping up the operation. Their quick victory was nearly ensured, bringing a quick end to the American rebellion. But God caused a thick fog to envelop the East River, enabling Washington's entire army to cross undetected at night and make a successful defeat retreat. And throughout the eight-year conflict, there were several times when the weather seemed to intervene on the American side, providing either a pathway to victory or retreat. In the last major battle of the War for Independence there at Yorktown, General Cornwallis was waiting to be rescued by the British Navy, but a, a hurricane, timely hurricane, blew the British Navy away and offshore. You see, it seems as though God's hand was directly involved in securing our freedom. From British tyranny. Perhaps even more importantly, God's hand has been upon this nation through the outpouring of His Spirit and great awakenings and revivals throughout history. In the 1730s and the 40s, the great first great awakening swept through the American colonies, turning the people from spiritual apathy and debauchery to deep personal faith in Christ and a return to reliance upon God and His Word. The revival was of enormous consequence in strengthening the soul of the people who would unite to establish this nation just 30 years later. All of the language about providence, about God that comes from our founders, really was a direct result of the efforts and the effects of the First Great Awakening 30 years before. And in the first 40 years of the 1800s, revivals swept across the American frontier in upstate New York. A rise of, of even vibrant evangelical faith in that era would also strengthen the abolitionist movement that would eventually free us 
with enormous cost and determination from the scourge of slavery. In 1854, in the halls of Congress, amazingly, these words were heard. In this age, quote, in this age there can be no substitute for Christianity. That was the religion of the founders of the republic and they expected it to remain the religion of their descendants, close quote. Indeed, it was the spiritual revivals of that era that spurred George Washington Gale to form his team to journey from upstate New York to the prairies of Illinois to establish this city which bears his name and would become a significant station for the Underground Railroad. America is great because America is good. When we defeated Germany and Japan at the end of World War II, we could have ruled and dominated the whole world. The war had not come to our shores. We had a robust economy and people were united. We had the strongest military and we had the bomb. No other nation had that capability. And what an opportunity for imperialistic adventures. We could have ruled the world. And if they had been in our place, what would have Russia done? How about China? Instead, America led the way in peace and rebuilding the war-torn world. And it did it on our dime. We paid for it. What other nation does that? No, America is good because in our founding, we understood that God shed his grace on us. And we were dependent upon his goodwill. But now, we have forgotten our past. We have amnesia. And there are those, including respected Christian leaders, who say that we were never a Christian nation. And that is technically true. We have no state-sponsored church like England or Sweden. And many, if not most, of the signers of our founding documents were anything but Orthodox Christians. Still, the history is very clear. That the men who risked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to establish the United States acknowledge their dependence upon God. Today, it seems as if every effort is made by our political and opinion leaders to erase our history. We have cultural amnesia, and our memory loss is not only expressed by our cultural elites, it is also lived out by the majority of our people. Church attendance and membership has never been lower. And if I were to ask each of you, how many people do you know that have stopped attending church in the last five years, I bet every single one of you could name at least a dozen. And even within the church, people are ignoring God's word and how they live, even within the church, simply choosing which parts of scripture that they will obey and what parts they will ignore. God has called. Wisdom has built her house. She has carved its seven columns. She has prepared a great banquet mixed with wines and set the table. She has sent her servants to invite everyone to come. She calls out from the heights overlooking the sea. Come in with me, she urges the simple. And to those who lack good judgment, she says, come and eat my food and drink the wine that I have mixed. Leave your simple ways behind and begin to live. Learn to use good judgment. We are turning our backs on God and on his word and on his wisdom. We are becoming a nation of fools. And I fear the price that we will have to pay. Repeating what we read earlier, I called you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice and rejected the correction that I offered. They rejected my advice and paid no attention when I corrected them. Therefore, they must eat the bitter fruit of living their own way, choking on their own schemes. For simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency. Friends, I want to explain three major areas in our cultural conversation today where we are intentionally rejecting God. There are others, many others. But these three narratives come from long-standing philosophies that have developed over decades, even centuries, to emerge in toxic secular initiatives today. The first is what we might call scienceism. For many years, we have seen the decline of traditional spiritual life 
in America. We have seen the rise of what some have called the nuns, people who say that they are spiritual, but they are religiously unaffiliated. They write their own rules, which of course is antithetical to biblical faith. But a spiritual vacuum cannot exist in human beings. We were made to connect with something, someone greater than us. That is an image of God in us. That void, that spiritual void, must be filled. The corona pandemic set the stage for the emergence of the religion of scientism. To be sure, a belief in science as the ultimate authority in life has been growing since the beginning of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. But the pandemic allowed it to become mainstream with its own clergy, the, the talking heads and, 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 and so-called experts, as well as its own pope, Dr. Tony Fauci. Trust the science became the motto, and CDC guidelines became the scriptures. Shutdowns and mitigations became the sacred laws that must be obeyed. Disturbingly, it was the dictates that came out of, the, out of scientism that sought to marginalize the essential service of faith communities. Churches were shuttered, some to never open again. Now, I'm not a conspiracy guy. I, I, I've had the vaccines. I've had the two vaccines even though I had my own bout with the virus. Trust the science? I don't know about you, but that is not a God that I want to worship. Science is good, but it is not God. It doesn't play, take the place of Almighty Creator God. How often has the science changed? How many mistakes have been made in the name of this religion? And how many lives have been lost in bad decisions and mental health complications? You see, scientism has no place, no room for the God of the Bible because faith is not subject. Faith is not subject to the scientific method. And so the scientism adherents reject Christian faith. And while on the surface it seems to be wise and full of good intention, the root of scienceism is infected with human pride and foolishness. Now, obviously, I am not a person of color. I have not lived that experience, so I cannot completely empathize, though I wish I could, with the struggles of people of color in this country that they have had to overcome to this day. That is why I do not wish to be understood in what I am about to say. As Christians, we are called to advocate for widows and orphans and the less fortunate people in our societies. The gospel compels us to hear the stories of those who are struggling and suffering, to feed the hungry, to work for justice, and to set the oppressed free. Indeed, it is, the only, it is only the gospel, only the gospel, friends. No politician, no, po no political system, no movement. It is only the gospel that can bring true freedom and justice because only the gospel is based on self-giving love than a grasp for power, which is the truth of all these other movements, all these other political movements. In the last 30 years, a new approach to addressing the inequities of society has emerged first in higher education and now in the culture at large. Critical theory is a diverse train of thinking that draws on various strands of postmodern thought. Psychoanalysis, deconstruction, and Marxism. Its most well-known manifestation in the last year has become is, no, is what is known as critical race theory, or CRT. But critical theory, including CRT, offers no answers. It only seeks to deconstruct and to tear down. It is divisive. Critical theory at its core is simply a radical grab for power like all of these other movements. It has the manifestations not only of racial issues, but in political systems, economic systems, and sexual identity politics. Critical theory is throughout those movements its Marxist roots are clearly seen in the division of society into two groups. You have the privileged oppressors, and you have the victims. You have, back in, back in the communist revolution, you had the bourgeois, the privileged bourgeois, and you had the proletariat, the people. 
But in all those Marxist revolutions that we have had, who comes out on top? A very small, elite, powerful elite, and everybody else suffers. The code of morality in Marxism is clear. Those who are privileged are evil. They must be silenced and overthrown. And those who are victims have all the moral authority. But let us not be naive. Marxism, wherever it has been institutionalized, as in the former Soviet Union and China, has always resulted in violent atrocities and the loss of freedom for, our, for most people. Marxism everywhere is violent, it is dangerous, and it is atheistic. What seems to be a cause for justice ends up being simply a power grab for the few because of the sinful nature of human, of human beings. Marxism and its manifestations in critical theory is radically atheistic. Why? Because with the emerging Marxist impulses in our culture, the church will always be an enemy that must be silenced or destroyed. We are viewed as oppressors because of the perception of privilege and our stand for biblical morality. Finally, in the last 50 years, we have witnessed the rise and triumph of the modern self and the sexual revolution. The roots of this movement go back to the emerging secular philosophies of the Enlightenment. They are centuries old. The LGBTQ agenda is the contemporary manifestation of this movement. We just finished the month of June, so-called Pride Month. Did you notice all of the rainbow flags being displayed in different ways? Why is it, friends, that the LGBTQ community is so militant in insisting that their identities be affirmed? You see, tolerance is not enough. We must support and affirm their lifestyle choices. LGBTQ people are insistent on acceptance because a person's identity is formed in community. Our first community was our family, through which people, through their words and actions, affirmed who we were, either for the good or for the bad. That's how we determined who, I, who we were. And as we grow, our community gets larger, but it is still always in the, in the dialogue of community that our sense of identity of who we are is formed. And that's why LGBTQ people demand, insist, and they will not give up that our, that our society accept them because it is a true psychological need for the self, the sense of self. But that is a problem for Bible-believing Christians because the scriptures clearly teach that those lifestyles are sinful, not consistent with a biblical lifestyle, and they are a distortion of God's design and plan. You see, we cannot affirm and celebrate LGBTQ lifestyles and be faithful to the scriptures. I'm sure you can connect the dots. Bible-believing Christians are the oppressors. We must be silenced or destroyed. And all three of these narratives, scientism, critical theory, sexual identity politics, seem to, be pursuing, seem to be pursuing good outcomes on the surface. They want to help those who are hurting, but they are all anti-God and anti-Christ. They are demonically inspired. We are not fighting friends against flesh and blood, as the Apostle Paul reminded the Ephesians, but rather against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You can see where things are headed. And is it any wonder that Bible-believing churches in America are wantonly criticized, marginalized, and declining? This is where we are. This is our reality. America, we have a problem. And then how should we, as the church, respond to this emerging and threatening reality? I resonate with the psalmist who said, rivers of tears gush from my eyes because people disobey your instructions. And when I hear the local news reports from our, in our city each morning, I shake my head in sadness at the foolishness and stubbornness of people who refuse to follow God's way. Do they not know? 
Could it be that they have never heard God's word and the invitation to life that is proclaimed in the scriptures? That probability should stir us to action and prayer. I am taken nearly to tears knowing that many church folk as well, however, ignore God's word, picking and choosing what suits them and live in wanton rebellion against him. These are so-called Christians. And if the people who are called by Christ's name choose foolishness rather than holiness, then there is no hope for the church. God cannot bless a sinful church or he would have to apologize to Israel and all the seven churches of Revelation. If we will not repent, judgment awaits. Well-known pastor John MacArthur, who, of whom I have never really been a fan, although he has given much to the church that is commendable. MacArthur claims that America is already under God's judgment. Perhaps that's true. I don't know. But I think the psalm that we read earlier offers us guidance and hope. So I trust the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on the bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose heart are right. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord still rules from heaven. Psalm 11, verses 1 through 4. What can the righteous do? Don't give up hope. God is in control and he's got this. He still rules from heaven, but there's more to, not, more to it than not giving in to despair. You see, we have an opportunity here, friends. There is real hope. Much of the influence of my thinking for this message came from a recent book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. In the closing words of the book, he observes this. He says, in the second century, the church was a marginal sect of a dominant, within a dominant pluralist society. She was under suspicion not because of her central dogmas were supernatural, but rather because she appeared subversive in claiming that Jesus was Lord and King. And they were viewed as immoral because of the Lord's table, eating and drinking of Christ's blood. And that is where we are today. We are viewed as subversive to where people want the culture to go. But the church's best days have always been when she has been under pressure. The church in the second century turned the world upside down because they were so different from the prevailing culture. They followed the words and the example of Jesus. They loved their enemies and they embraced the outcasts. They were a holy church intolerant of sin and spiritual rebellion with our own people. So friends, let us return to being that holy, loving, and faithful community faith that has challenged the pagan culture of this day. Let us be a people of prayer. Let's be like wisdom, inviting people, everyone in this nation and this nation of fools to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. Friends, the gospel shines brightest in the darkest night. We must understand the time in which God has sovereignly placed us. We are here we are here, friends, for such a time as this. Let us take courage and look to Jesus, who through his death and resurrection has already secured our victory. Let's pray. Father, this more message this morning sobers us. We pray that you would hear your spirit speaking to us. And if there has been anything, any word that is Bob Myers, I pray that that would be swept away and only your word heard. But Lord, cause us to be that victorious church, a church which is holy, a church which listens to you and has strong faith in the face of growing opposition, 
and discouragement. Rise, raise up our spirits, Father. Raise up our faith that we might look to you and know that Jesus is Lord and send us out as emissaries of the good news of this wisdom that can save us through Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. May we be faithful in these special days and to which you have placed us. For the sake of your kingdom, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.